This sea of deep blue is the Adriatic, an arm of the Mediterranean that bathes more than 800 kilometers of the shores of Croatia. From the very beginning of antiquity, right up until its independence in 1991, Croatia has been subjected to the influence of a host of civilizations. But what would forge its history was above all its strategic position along the sea routes that link the Orient and the Occident. For more than five centuries, from the end of the Middle Ages up until the beginning of the 20th century, three great powers struggled for control of the region. To the west, the Venetian Republic that is seeking to control the trade routes to the Orient. To the east, with Istanbul their capital, the Ottomans who occupy a large portion of Europe. And later from Vienna in the north, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that would control the region until the end of the First World War. Approaching the maritime cities where this history was forged by the sea is undoubtedly the most beautiful way to discover and understand the shores of Croatia, a bridge between east and west. mild climate, lush vegetation, sumptuous villas. Opatia is the pearl of the Croatian Riviera. Like the rest of the country, the region of Opatia has been subjected to many different influences. But it was in the 19th century under the Austro-Hungarian Empire that the city had its shining moment. The development of the road systems and above all the opening of the railroad line from Vienna in 1873 quickly made Opatia the favorite vacation spot of the crowned heads, artists, and businessmen. Tourism in Croatia, and not only in this region, made its real debut in Opatia in 1881. Here behind me, you can see a villa dating back to that time. It's called the Villa Angiolina. What we can definitely say is that starting from 1881, the year that this villa was constructed under the reign of Franz Joseph, the Emperor of Austria, and especially with the construction of the Hotel Kvarner the following year, was when tourism was born here in Opatia. Many celebrities stayed here in Opatia. They followed in the wake of Franz Joseph and his entourage. There were many, but the most interesting, without a doubt, was Chekhov. Certain personalities preferred to remain incognito. They would come here in secret. So Opatia became the most prominent city in the region and a favorite place for lovers to meet. That's surely why they built all these villas. The far north of the Croatian coast is occupied by the peninsula of Istria. Pula, situated on the tip of the peninsula, is one of the oldest cities on the Adriatic coast, and according to legend, it was founded by Jason and the Argonauts. In 1848, whether it was a choice dictated by the topography or simple coincidence, it was at Pula that the Austro-Hungarian admirals decided to build their shipyards. In a few years, Pula became the main naval base of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When the court of Austria decided to build a naval base at Pula, 
In around 1850, it was no more than a little fishing port, bounded by this little fortress right here. They decided to set up the shipyard over there, on the little island of Ulyanic. That's where the boatyard already was at the time. Once the shipyard was completed, not a single day went by without them launching new boats from the dry docks. At the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, Austria possessed a navy that was very much ahead of its time and was the world's eighth naval power. At the time, the people living here had the feeling that they were living in a powerful, organized country, ruled by laws. This town had the first movie houses, the first tramways. There was a thriving cultural life. They built clubs for the sailors, the Marine Casino, which was the officers' club, a theater, a music hall. All the different nationalities that lived here in Pula at that time had the same rights. The port of Pula was in fact active even back during the time of the Romans. Temples, triumphal arches, the city has a wealth of monuments that are said to have inspired Italian Renaissance artists like Palladio. From a more pragmatic point of view, the city planners will tell you that the Roman town is everywhere, right under the asphalt, and that every time they undertake a new building project, it pops up as if by magic. The site where the Roman colony of Pula was founded had already been inhabited since the 11th century BC. There are many vestiges dating from that period, some even go back to 3000 BC. But it was with the arrival of the Romans that the town was truly born. Before the Romans, this region was inhabited by the Istrian tribes, from whom it got its name. In 177 BC, the Romans drove out the Istrians, then later founded the colony of Pula in 44 BC. The amphitheater gives us an idea of the size of the city at the time of the Romans. It was so big that they had to build it outside the city. At the time, Pula had no more than 5,000 inhabitants, whereas the arena could hold 23,000 spectators. And it was the largest city in Istria. People came from all over the region to watch the gladiator fights. Pula naturally has grown since ancient times, but if you look at the old town today, it occupies precisely the same location as the former Roman town. From the 4th century AD on, the Roman Empire was besieged with problems. In 395, on the death of the Emperor Theodosius, his sons split the empire in two, the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire, which soon became the Byzantine Empire, with Constantinople as its capital. Under the pressure of the ceaseless barbarian attacks, the Western Roman Empire collapsed. In 539, the Byzantine Empire regained control of Istria for several decades, bringing its art in which we can see the influence of ancient Rome blended with the refinement of the Orient, as is evident here in the mosaics of the Basilica of Porridge.
Rijeka, the number one port of Croatia, is the point of departure for the cruise ships and ferries serving the cities in the south of the country. Just a stone's throw from the port, the Corso, a pedestrian street, cuts through the center of town. The look of the passers-by, as well as the atmosphere, makes it obvious that Croatia has fallen into step with the West. Only the clock tower, adorned with a double-headed eagle, still reminds us that the city was under the domination of the double Austro-Hungarian monarchy until 1918. down the coast of Croatia is underway. During the night after leaving Rijeka, our boat set a course south for Zadar, our first port of call. Zadar is protected from the winds and storms by a number of islands, an important advantage at the time of sailing ships. It has held a strategic position on the Adriatic coast for centuries. Almost completely destroyed during the Second World War, then bombarded by the Yugoslav army during the War of Independence from 1991 to 1995, Zadar is once again back on its feet. Zadar still has some reminders of its occupation by ancient Rome. The size of the Forum, which dates back to the first century BC, gives us an idea of just how big the city was when it was an imperial colony. Erected on the esplanade of the Forum, the Church of St. Donat is a splendid monument. Constructed in the 9th century, it's a masterpiece of pre-Romanesque architecture similar to Carolingian buildings. Clean lines, simple decor. They say that the Bishop Donat had this church built on the model of Charlemagne's Palatine Chapel in Aix-la-Chapelle in France. From the end of the Byzantine rule in the 11th century up until the 15th century and the beginning of the Venetian rule, Zadar underwent a turbulent Dark Ages, occupied in turn by the Franks, the Crusaders, and the Croatian kings. It was a tormented yet creative period, as the magnificent Cathedral of St. Anastasia clearly shows. Once Zadar came under Venetian domination, the danger lay to the east. Starting in 1500, there were Ottoman raids from Bosnia. They kidnapped the inhabitants, stole cattle, burned villages, a normal practice with all the armies of the Middle Ages. To counter this Ottoman aggression, Venice set about reinforcing the city's ancient fortifications. In 
In 1570, the Turks occupied the entire inland region and had advanced as far as Zadar. The two parties signed a treaty, leaving Venice in control of a strip of land seven kilometers wide around the town. Venice had managed to preserve its vital interests and could continue trading on the Adriatic. But this arrangement angered the Uskosks. The Uskosks, whose name means refugee, were Catholic peasants. As the Turks advanced, they retreated, seeking the protection of the Venetians. Driven from their land, these peasants became fearsome pirates. At the beginning, they attacked only Ottoman vessels. The Uskoks were fighting to free their land from Turkish occupation. They pillaged and plundered all through the region. They eventually joined the Venetian army and fought in its ranks. But when the Venetians concluded a trade agreement with the Turks, the Uskoks rose up against the Venetians. They became pirates and attacked the Ottoman fleet and the Venetian merchant marine alike. They were fighting above all to recuperate their possessions, their burnt houses, to win back their confiscated land. In fact, they were fighting simply to survive because there were so many people on that seven kilometer wide strip of land that pillaging was their only means of survival. When the Turkish threat began to recede, the Uskosks wanted to move back inland, but the Venetians and Austrians refused. For over the years, these pirates had become very organized and at that point represented a powerful bloc. So the two leading powers of the Adriatic came to an agreement to eliminate their former ally. Hanged, decapitated, deported, the Uskosks were erased from the pages of history as quickly and mysteriously as they had entered. In the morning, with the sun just beginning to peek over the horizon, we're once again on our way, heading south towards Split. The Adriatic is as calm as a pond. In fact, the captain is navigating in a kind of channel between the islands and the mainland. Soon we can make out the city beyond the ship's bow. Ferry boats, freighters, sailboats. The traffic is heavy, so we cautiously enter the port of Split at half speed.
the old town dominated by the cathedral's bell tower slips by before our eyes. Split is a special city, mysterious, elusive, surprising. A medieval city that down through the centuries has grown and developed inside the ancient Roman palace, the Emperor Diocletian's palace, packed into the smallest possible space. Even the thick walls are no exception to this rule. Let's follow our guide into the depths of this gigantic stone labyrinth to get an idea of what this palace was like in the third century AD. Here we're in the cellars of Diocletian's palace. Well, maybe cellar is not the most accurate word, as it is actually a substructure supporting the upper part of the palace where the emperor's residence was. The palace, constructed on a slightly sloped terrain, originally had direct access to the sea. It was a sort of rectangular fortified castle covering 30,000 square meters. These rooms, in fact, had several functions. The first was to carry the upper part. Secondly, they were used as a larder for everyone living in the palace. That is, the emperor, his family, the guests, but also the soldiers and the slaves. And lastly, these rooms were used as a shelter for the boats, as, at the time, the palace came directly out onto the sea. Back out in the open air, we can feast our eyes on this charming jumble of periods and styles. The peristyle, a monumental space in the heart of the palace. The emperor's apartment faced out onto this courtyard which is now a popular meeting place for wandering tourists or an impromptu concert hall. The palace contains several temples dedicated to the gods of the Roman pantheon. The Temple of Jupiter, with its barrel vaulted ceiling, has survived the centuries intact, but that is only because it has been transformed into a church. The early 4th century AD was a period of great upheavals. Diocletian was probably the last emperor to persecute the Christians. He abdicated in 3005 and then died in his palace in 3013, just one year after his successor, Constantine, had converted to Christianity. Upon the death of Diocletian, the Christians invaded the palace seeking revenge. The Temple of Jupiter became the Church of St. John the Baptist. They performed their baptisms there, which until then had taken place outside the palace. They converted the emperor's mausoleum into a church dedicated to St. Domius, whom Diocletian had condemned to death in 304.
With the fall of the Roman Empire, Croatia entered a long period of unrest. Faced with the barbarian hordes that swept the land, the inhabitants transformed Diocletian's palace into a fortified city where the fleeing population could seek shelter. The Christians transformed the imperial palace into small apartments and made their home there. Under the influence of the Venetians, who controlled Split for four centuries, the city turned to trade. Following the fashion of the time, the shops occupied the ground floor of the buildings and the dwellings were on the first floor. Little by little, the ancient palace was occupied and transformed. They added floors. And that's when the old town began to look like it does today. Once again, we get underway. Korčula, our next port of call, is one of the most beautiful islands in southern Croatia. We're navigating in the middle of a multitude of islands and islets, covered with conifers and thick scrub, a pleasing blend of deep blues and greens. And at last we arrive before a little jewel of stone and red tile posed on the sea, Korčula. With its strategic position on the sea routes of the Adriatic, Korčula was for a long time the rival of Dubrovnik, its powerful neighbor. Korčula is now a very fashionable tourist destination. Even though ferry boats keep it connected to the mainland, it has kept a certain peace and quiet, just as it has maintained certain traditions, like sailing. The mariners of Korčula are said to be some of the best in the Mediterranean, as Captain Ratko Marinovic explains. For example, my grandpa My grandfather, for example, he was on a Russian boat. My father sailed on English, American, and Yugoslav boats. And me too. I've sailed on German boats, French companies, uh, many, many different companies. To survive down through the centuries, our family, like the seagoing families of Korčula, had to serve under the colors of other great powers. Either we were citizens of Venice or we were ruled by the Republic of Dubrovnik, like the neighboring city of Orobic. We had no other option if we wanted to continue earning our living from the sea. We had to pay a daily tax to Venice or to the Sultan of Istanbul. It was the only way to survive here. 
Mora u mome životu puno znači. Mi smo tradicionalno... The sea is everything for my family. We've been living with the sea for more than 500 years. The first sailor in the Marinovic family goes back to 1420. We've been mariners and ship owners for generations. Our life is completely oriented towards the sea. She gives us our livelihood. As if being skilled seamen weren't enough for them, the inhabitants of Korchula are also excellent shipwrights. The rivalry between Korchula and Dubrovnik for the control of the Adriatic trade routes was soon to shift to the field of architecture. In the 15th century, Korchula was striving to outdo Dubrovnik, and with its striving stone-cutting industry, it indulged itself in a veritable building frenzy. The result is this Gothic city with certain Renaissance touches that we see here today. In the heart of the old town is a building that is a venerated treasure for the citizens of Korchula. It's not a church or a shrine or even a chapel. No, it's just a simple house where a certain Marco Polo once lived. Legend? Conjecture? Not at all. It is an incontrovertible fact for the historian that we met, whose name is Vladimir de Polo. Korchula, at the time of Marco Polo in the 13th century, was situated on the very active trade route from Venice to the Middle East and the Holy Land. Every week during the Crusades, there were boats on their way from Venice to the Holy Land that would call at Korchula. At that time, the ships would sail, hugging the coastline, and sail only during the day. This sea route that ran along the coast of what is now Croatia offered a great number of harbors and islands that offered good shelter. Korchula was certainly a port of call on the route to the Orient. They've even found traces of certain Polo families having lived in Korchula in the 13th century. But how can we be sure that Marco Polo was in fact born here? It's not easy to keep track of such a globetrotter. Marco Polo is the best year of his life. Marco Polo spent a good part of his life traveling. He was 17 when he left for China and did not return to Venice until 14 years later, when he would have grown into a mature man. In 1298, when he comes back from China, we find him in the thick of a fierce quarrel between the Venetian and Genovese republics. Korchula would always have a place in its heart for Marco Polo, because he defended his native city in that naval battle, where he was then taken prisoner. It was in prison in Genoa that he wrote his famous book, Il Milione, the Book of Marvels. Had he not been taken captive, Marco Polo might never have written it, and we would have never known anything about his journey to China or his adventures and discoveries.
shipbuilding, stone cutting, sailing. There's one more tradition that we can add to the list, the Moresca. From the Spanish, Moresco, meaning the Moors of Northern Africa. The Moresca is a chivalrous game that originally pit Christians against Muslims. This tradition probably arrived in Cortula in 1571 at the time of the Turkish siege of the city. The goal of the combat between the two opposing sides, the Red Army and the Black Army, is to free Buddha, the beautiful captive damsel. We cross the southern border of Croatia and enter Montenegro. This small country was, like Croatia, born out of the breakup of the Yugoslav Federation. Its history resembles that of the entire region. The small walled towns of Sveti Stefan and Budua, with its graceful slender bell tower, heritage of five centuries of Venetian influence. The mouth of Kotor, that opens onto the Adriatic Sea, is an impressive fjord that penetrates the mainland for several dozen kilometers. The ancient Romans were well aware of the strategic importance of the mouth of Kotor, and during the Middle Ages, it was fought over and successively occupied by the Saracens, the Bulgarians, and Hungarians. Eventually, it was Venice that took control. At Kotor, like everywhere else on the Adriatic coast, the Venetians had to come to an agreement with the Ottomans who occupied the inland regions in order to maintain their supremacy in trade. Machiavellism? Real politique? We have to admit that in spite of certain crises and passing conflicts, the Turks and Venetians managed to coexist peacefully for all of the 16th and 17th centuries.
leaving behind these splendid monastery islands floating on the surface like water lilies of stone, we head out of the mouth of Kotor and make for our last port of call, Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik, formerly Ragusa, is undoubtedly the most well-known city of Croatia. Every year, millions of tourists flock to this walled city. Like Venice, its former rival, Dubrovnik has become a sort of museum city that you visit leisurely on foot. Right now, Dubrovnik is waking up. The people heading into the old town are employees, guides, shopkeepers. Do they have the time to appreciate the beauty of their still deserted city? Or are they already thinking of the tens of thousands of tourists that they will have to welcome? Founded in the 7th century, the little town expanded under the protection of first the Byzantine Empire and later Venice. In order to free themselves of the increasingly oppressive rule of the Serenissima, the nobles of Ragusa, who were astute negotiators, signed a number of agreements with Venice's rivals, Ancona, Pisa, Ravenna. They did the same thing with the Ottomans at the beginning of the 15th century. From that point on, Dubrovnik's fleet could sail and trade unhampered throughout the Mediterranean, from Spain to Syria. This was the golden age of Dubrovnik. In 1667, Dubrovnik was almost annihilated by a terrible earthquake. Very quickly, the city was reconstructed and resumed trading. Even though its ships were then sailing as far as India and the New World, the times had changed. Venice and the Ottomans once again assumed control. Dubrovnik was never again the powerful city that it had been before the earthquake, but it still remains one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The streets, the palaces, the churches are the most visible evidence of the incredible destiny of Dubrovnik. Carefully preserved in the city archives, there are other more discreet testimonies that give a detailed account of the relations the city managed to establish with the rest of the world. Dubrovnik has been developing since antiquity. Down through the centuries, it established connections with many countries. Several documents attest to the relations with Spain, for example, and the House of Aragon, with Byzantium. For from 1204 on, Dubrovnik accepted the rule of the Byzantine Empire. Later, in 1434, Dubrovnik established a trade agreement with the Muslim infidels. Thanks to that agreement, Dubrovnik not only avoided being invaded, but it even grew rich trading with the Ottoman Empire. 
So, from the 15th century on, Dubrovnik was a vassal state of the Sultan of Constantinople. That's why we have more than 25,000 Turkish documents here in the municipal archives. One of them is this edict issued by the Emperor Suleiman, dictating the tribute that Dubrovnik had to pay to the Ottoman Empire. Once the agreements were made between the nobles of Ragusa and the Ottoman Emperor, what were the day-to-day -day relations like between the two partners? The subjects of the Sultan who came from the interior of the country, from Herzegovina or Bosnia, spoke our language. They could circulate freely in the city. There were even overnight accommodations for them, and in especially for them. And they were completely free and perfectly integrated into Dubrovnik's everyday life. Concerning the official presence of the Ottoman Empire in the Republic, it was limited to two customs officers. One was stationed outside the city walls and the other at the village of Ston, near the salt flats. The town customs officer was something like the Sultan's ambassador. He would look out for the interests and rights of the subjects of the Ottoman Empire here in Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik had to pay tribute to the Ottomans? No matter. The city was growing rich by trading with the rest of the world, and in particular, with the Orient. During the 15th century and a part of the 16th, a period known as the Golden Age of Dubrovnik, more than 500 ships were sailing under the city's colors on all the oceans of the world. The merchandise that arrived at Dubrovnik from the Orient was mostly a variety of pelts, leather, cotton, wool, rug sometimes, oriental clothing. You should know that the inhabitants of Dubrovnik were very fond of oriental clothes. The rector's palace and the council chamber were decorated with rugs and tablecloths from Istanbul. As for the products going from the Occident to the Orient, they were mainly cloth, brocades and fine silks. But there were also more technically advanced products that were lacking in the Ottoman Empire, like glasses, telescopes, and medical products, medicine in particular. Tucked away in the calm of the Franciscan monastery, this pharmacy, founded in 1317, one of the oldest in Europe, shows the high level of knowledge and development of society at that time. But up against the Venetians, the Ottomans, and other sovereigns of Hungary or Central Europe, the knowledge of medicine and pharmacology was not very useful. To protect itself, Dubrovnik had no other resources but its diplomatic skill and its fortifications. As the city continued to grow, they had to ensure its defense. During the Gothic period, they built a large part of the city's fortified walls with large square towers. They were well adapted to the arms of the period, which were bows and arrows or stone balls that were thrown down onto the enemy from the ramparts. Begun in the 13th century, the construction of the ramparts gradually changed over time, which makes for their charm. Starting in 1453, the date of the fall of Constantinople, semicircular bastions, notably on the entrance to the port, were added to the original square towers from the Gothic period. 
The development of firearms brought about the reinforcement of the exterior part of the fortifications through the addition of semicircular bastions, particularly on the north side of the city. The thickness of the walls surrounding Dubrovnik varies depending on the location, from three to six meters on the north side, two to four meters on the south. The ramparts are undoubtedly Dubrovnik's most precious heritage, not only on account of their historical and architectural value, but also because they've become, for tourists all over the world, the very symbol of the city. The beautiful stone homes that line the Stradum, the city's main thoroughfare, are no longer shops and stalls where the voyagers from Constantinople, Vienna or Venice would come seeking to buy gold, silk, brocades and oriental carpets. Even if the times have changed, when you stroll through the neighborhoods at the foot of the ramparts, you can sometimes hear the winds of the Adriatic carrying a blend of voices from east and west. Tu počiva naše 